and founder of the Reading Foundation. Tell us what the Reading Foundation is. Sure. Um, I was a school psychologist for about a dozen years, mm -hmm. and then um, a trail of research led me to um, create the Reading Foundation. So it's a private clinic, and we do intensive remedial programs for students of all ages mm -hmm. in basic reading and spelling, comprehension, written language, and math. So those are all programs we've created over the years. So all ages being primary school and high school? Even through adult. We've had a lot of adult clients as well. So we work with five-year-olds, as young as five, and we go right through adulthood, right? Is this a necessary thing? Is there not enough help in school? I'm afraid the answer to that question is yes. I, I think in general, um, I don't want to just slag the school system. I think they do a fantastic job of providing very enriching programs um, for students very interesting programs, very engaging. They focus on developing their thinking, their understanding. And I think if you look over the years, like since I was in school, that was mm -hmm. like a million years ago, <laughs> to now, I mean, the, the environments are completely different. I mean, it's unbelievable how rich and rewarding it is for many students. But I think where it's short is in providing students with programs for reading delays or disabilities or math delays or disabilities, I don't think that st schools do a very good job with that. I think what happens is they provide students with what they can, but they often don't even know what students really need. And so what students, what schools can provide versus what students need is a huge gap. I don't think that a lot of people are aware of just how much time it takes to remediate a reading problem if a child has one. It is a very significant enterprise and schools just do not have the delivery mechanism for that. One of the criticisms I've heard from parents, although it may not be justified, is that there is less time spent on the basic sort of math and language, mm -hmm. and now much more time spent on other things, which mm -hmm. is, you know, teaching values and teaching all, all mm -hmm. sorts of other things, you know, financial literacy and all the things that used to be really under the parents' the domain. domain. Of parents. Mm. Yes, that's true. Um, and I think there's some truth to that argument. I guess the other side of it is if the parents can't or won't provide it, then who does? Mm -hmm. So schools have definitely watered certain things down. I think a, a great deal of time is still spent on basics, but I don't think the teaching methods are necessarily good ones. They don't lead to the outcomes that really? we want. Well, if you look at math scores, for example, across the country, they've been declining for the last five years. And I think it has a lot to do with methodology. Mm -hmm. So teaching methodology, not necessarily how much time they're actually getting, but children are exposed to, let's say, manipulatives, you know, to learn math, math skills. But they're sort of encouraged to develop their own strategies for multiplication now. Mm -hmm. never, they never encourage, it seems, to, to the point of just sort of going from there to making those 8 times 7 tables automatic, mm -hmm. you know? Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a lack of a leap there. So, for example, in my clinic, um, I, I test children using um, a math test that we've developed that is geared to the curriculum. So the Alberta curriculum, now we're going to come into Toronto, we're going to use the Ontario curriculum mm -hmm. standard, and we have a, I have a clinic in, in BC as well, so we use the BC curriculum standard. You have a child, say, in grade three or four, and you ask them to do eight times seven. Right. They'll start drawing circles. Yeah. <laughs> they'll draw circles, they'll draw circles, they'll draw circles, and then they might have the idea correct, but then they have to start counting within the circles. So they come up with an answer like, you know, 52. Right. Because they've miscounted. Whatever happened to the times tables exactly. we used to have to memorize? Exactly. I mean, it was, it was an exercise, but... I remember them now. Mm -hmm. like, you, you do, and you remember them. It's important that it's not just memorization. You probably mm -hmm. understood the concept. Exactly. So the child does need to understand the concept. And mm -hmm. so when they draw the little circles like that, it shows an understanding of the concept. But you have to take the next step and make it internal. You have to make it in their head, turn it into their head. For me, I'm, I'm like Sharon. I had to memorize them. I oh, went yeah. to a French lycée. I can still see all those mm -hmm. multiplication tables right. yeah. in my head. Right. 
I have no problem going right. to the counter and knowing how much change exactly. is coming back to me. You but might... now, kids just without a calculator. That's the that's the, <laughs> that's the go-to. They get the, oh, they have yeah. a calculator, and I think well. A calculator is okay, but if you slip your finger or the battery runs out, what are you going to do? That's right. You, know, you still have to have a, your own number sense. You have to know that 8 times 7 is going to lead you to something close so, to what you need. Where do the parents fall in the scheme of this? I know when uh, my children were growing up, I spent a huge amount of time reading with them, spending time with them. I knew where they were at. My one child developed in a reading sense far more quickly than the other one. Mm -hmm. And... I felt very engaged. Our parents, uh, I, I know a lot of parents are way busy. I mean, I was very fortunate to be at home a great deal. Do parents have enough time and are kids getting enough attention at home? Um, well, I think that varies per family. Right. Like you said, so many of them are so tied up, they don't necessarily have time or mm -hmm. energy at the end of the day to sit down and work with their children. However, <clears throat> we can't forget, excuse mm -hmm. me, sorry, <clears throat> I need some water. Tis the season. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're getting you some there. Okay. Um, we can't forget that the simply exposing children to something by reading to them mm -hmm. isn't a necessary condition for learning to read. Mm -hmm. um, my mom, way back when, I won't even say when, um, never read to me. Mm -hmm. Didn't have time. Huge family. Too many children. Never read to me. I still learned how to read. So something happens in the instructional process that teaches the child to read. Mm -hmm. So reading to them is a good thing to do. Well, and but for the for the parents <coughs> from the parents' perspective to to have your child read to you, um, I would think that would while they're getting the instruction at school and teachers are are he hearing how well or how not well the child is developing in a reading sense, um, it's it certainly must help for. For everyone involved, the parents are keenly aware of where their child is in terms of their reading development. I think it's very important, and I think my experience has been that parents usually are very aware mm -hmm. of what their children are and are lacking or you know have strengths in. So, like you noticed with your own children, mm -hmm. you have they're one, very different. One one learned very quickly, one did not. So the question is, why did that happen? Mm -hmm. It isn't necessarily because of anything you did. It has a lot to do with how they are, how mm -hmm. they process Absolutely. information, how quickly, how slowly they do that. Um, so I think that <clears throat> there's an analogy I developed last year that I think is a good one. When it comes to learning anything, um, human learning paces and patterns depend on the type of nervous system we'll say that you have. So if you have a nervous system that's like organic soil, mm -hmm and you throw a seed onto that soil, then you don't need a whole lot of instruction to get it going. You know, it's going to make its own connections. Mm -hmm. So some children learn how to read and do math that way. They make their own connections very quickly, very mm -hmm. easily. Children who have difficulty, though, sort of fall into three levels after that. There's a, the kids that I call, um, you know, the, well, the... <laughs> Now I've lost my train. <laughs> Shows you what, yeah, anyway. Uh, so they're children who have, like, uh, sandy soil. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's going to need some work right. to get it going. So you have to add fertilizer and work it. But you can still work it. You're still going to get them to be fairly mm -hmm. rich. Then you have kids who have uh, soil that's more like concrete, a learning style that's more like concrete. It's, they're going to need a lot of work. You're going to have to bring in some jackhammers, right, like mm -hmm. that. Right. Then you have way over there, you have the granite kids. Now you need dynamite. <laughs> Just to get a little wow. dust. Yeah. But it's true. I mean, you can take a very bright child and put them on that continuum. Mm -hmm. You know, very, maybe high IQ scores. But if they're a granite when it comes to learning to, to that, read, yeah. to, that, to that process, they're going to need tons and tons and tons and tons of instructional mm -hmm. time to get them to a point near normal. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So we, That's me we and see that. that. <laughs> there you go. And we see that every day in our clinics. Yeah. Every day we see children who fall on that kind of continuum when it comes to reading or math or, you know, comprehension of those core processing areas. The schools do a, a generally a good job and hit a lot of kids, and so they do succeed. You know, most mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. do learn how mm -hmm. to read, but those who don't, don't get the kind of attention they need dependent on that style, whether they're concrete yeah. or, you know. I think a lot of children have stumbling blocks in learning, mm -hmm. and it's a question of finding a way around it. That's right. the way I look mm -hmm. at it. And if you, if that's all you're doing, and the teacher has a small class, she can get at it quickly in grade one or grade two and help them find the find way. But, way. Yeah. But if the, it's missed, then it just keeps mounting and mounting. And I had an experience Correct. like that with a friend's child. Mm -hmm. And once she was put back on track, 
-hmm. She then won a reading award. Mm -hmm. I mean, it didn't mm -hmm. take long. Mm -hmm. No, it, it yeah, and, and every child is a little different that way. So some kids, it's, it is fairly easy to get them back on track, and others it just isn't. So the Reading Foundation mm -hmm. for uh, centers now, it's coming to Toronto in yeah. the summer of 2016, but centers where the Reading Foundation exists already, how do how do families find their way to you? Like, how do, how do they wind up at the Reading Foundation to get the help that, that they need? Parents talk to parents. Mm. <laughs> Um, and but we do also get referrals from schools and other mm -hmm. professionals for sure. But you know, parents, after a while, we've I think we've earned a, a really excellent word of mouth reputation. So just about everybody who comes in now has heard of us or mm -hmm. knows somebody who directly who's yeah, benefited from our programs. That's fantastic. It is. And yeah. for for children or I guess older people as well that come to you, uh, mm -hmm. what kind of time commitment uh, it comes from them? Again, it will depend on that concrete granite <laughs> continuum, right? Yeah. right? So if it's really severe, they're going to need more time. Sure. But our program is very different from traditional tutoring yeah. because we immerse students in our program. So we like them to come every day mm -hmm. for four hours, and it's one-on-one -on -one the whole time. They come five days a week. Usually two weeks will do for some kids, and then 22 weeks will, will be needed for somebody else. Do you know what I'm saying? So we, we just keep monitoring their progress yeah. and, and make adjustments as needed. As That's time goes quite on. a commitment for it's a child, huge. though, who's been to school for eight hours. Yeah. Well, they don't come after school. They miss school. Yeah. Oh. If they're young enough. Yeah. This is the way I look at it. Look, if you have a child who's in elementary school, right, and they come to us in the morning and they're learning how to read, what are they listening or what are they missing? Yeah. A little bit of curriculum which they'll always catch up on if once they know how to read. And the schools are okay with that? Some are great with that. Some <laughs> some love us to do that, you know, work with the mm -hmm. child and they're very good. They make you know, they make amends and they make adjustments in the timetable for the child. Other schools are adamant that, you know, the child mm -hmm. just cannot miss this important curriculum. But again, it's only maybe for a few weeks. A few weeks. A few weeks. So yeah, that's it's nothing. It's yeah. not like it's six nothing. months. No. But yet you no. and your team must see some real elevated self-esteem from some of these young people. You know, <clears throat> I'm getting to the point where really I should be retiring, never mind opening up a clinic in Toronto. <laughs> as, in fact, I was going to, but <laughs> I cannot think of my life being more rewarding than having chosen to do what I've done. Yeah. It, it is, I was a school psychologist for 12 years and I got, I don't think I ever had a parent come up to me and say, Oh, Dr. Truce, you know, those recommendations you made for my child's IPP, they're fantastic. Now he's just the wonder, most, most mm -hmm. wonderful reader. Never once did I get anything mm -hmm. like that, right? Now it's like every week, every day, every I get messages, letters, I get emails now. It, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's, um, so not only do we yeah. in change their reading and their self-esteem, we change their life. And it'll pay forward if, because it's going to it's, address how they see their children's futures. That. Well, it's interesting because last, just last Friday I was still in Calgary and I got a call from an adult, right, who had been a student in our program 15 years prior, really? now had a daughter, mm -hmm. and he said, my daughter is not reading up to par, I know she isn't, I just want you to get her into the program right away. That's awesome. <laughs> and, and he said, you changed my life and wow. I've done so well. Wow. Now, that's not an uncommon story. That's the thing. It's very common for us to get that feedback even years after the child has left the clinic. Mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, it's amazing. My child could never have graduated without this program. And you go down and look in the file, and, you know, they came to us in grade five. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's so you're, you're building a foundation for their future, for sure. Click the channel subscribe button for full-length interviews and more from What She Said here on YouTube.